Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, if you will, let's start to take our seats so that we can stay on schedule. We'll give you about five minutes to get settled in. So before we get started, we have a few safety, um, I guess you would call them safety issues to uh, speak about. For If we should have to evacuate for any reason, the exits are clearly marked to our right, to your, to your left. <laughs> uh, the restrooms and water is out the hall and to your left. And that's about it. So again, good morning and welcome to the 2019 Joint Science and Technology Institute. My name is Darnell Gardner, and I am the STEM manager for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department. Before we get started, I'd like to have all of our GISTI participants stand up. Outstanding. They did a phenomenal job, a phenomenal job. Okay, ah, stay up, stop, don't sit down, stay up. Now, just the participants, let's give our family and friends a round of applause for supporting your efforts. Let's give them a gisty hello. Come on now. Okay, now we can sit. So it's it's been a it's been a phenomenal two weeks. We've had such a great time. I'll tell you what, I don't know if I can return to my regular life of sitting at a desk, You're just engaging with the kids. It was nonstop action, day after day after day. So I think that when I get home, I'm going to take a long break, if I know how to. So some of you might wonder, why would the Department of Defense invest in a program such as this? Um, words won't do it justice. I have a video that was produced by our very own Chris Prin and Louis Palacios. And we're going to watch that video. It gives you a, a snapshot of what actually occurred during the program. JSTI inspires me to expand my learning opportunities and branch out and really see what different careers have to offer. JSTI inspires me to bring back new and unique opportunities to my students. It inspires me by the individuals who come here and how everybody has a goal and a path in mind and how they are achieving that goal by coming here to follow their dreams. JSTI makes me want to do something, have a career in science because uh, it's something that is needed for like our country and our national security, but also because it's really interesting and it's a really rewarding career. It makes me feel like that I can do things in the future that will make me be like, not like super famous, but like I can do things bigger in the future than as I'm doing it right now. JSTI has given me the opportunity to step out of my classroom and spend two weeks in the summer working with scientists in real labs on real problems. These problems require STEM skills that I need to take back to my students and help them to hone and be future STEM workers to solve real world problems in real time situations. That's it. The Joint Science and Technology Institute Aberdeen place. Proving Grounds, or GISTI APG, is a two week residential research experience sponsored by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department. The program is open to teachers, high school students, and middle school students from across the United States and Department of Defense schools overseas. GISTI participants are mentored by DOD and civilian professionals while participating in hands-on, high-impact STEM projects commensurate to the latest innovative research. In addition, participants are given information concerning potential career opportunities in the Department of Defense working as a scientist or engineer. As our national security concerns grow, so does the need for a well-qualified workforce ready to meet DOD's future technological needs. I'm Morgan Minyard. I have a PhD in soil science, and I also work for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, specifically RDCBS Advanced and Emerging Threats Division. 
During the last two years of my dissertation, I actually had a smart scholarship sponsored by DITRA that allowed me to focus on my research, but also I knew that I would have a job with the Department of Defense upon graduation. So while all my other students were looking for jobs and writing their dissertation, I could just focus on my research and writing. Ever since I've been working at DITRA, I've really wanted to give back to the STEM community, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, encouraging students to go to college, study the STEM fields, and one day maybe even get a job with the Department of Defense. That led me to be a mentor with the Joint Science and Technology Institute. My name is Khalil Zink. I am a senior at West Virginia University. In 2014, I was selected to be part of the JSTI program. While there, I was assigned to be part of the Water Quality Group, which was led by Morgan. Throughout my time at JSTI, I was led uh, to um, my major, Environmental Soil and Water Science. I'm inspired, what's next? 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 We're inspired, what's next? Okay, now we can clap. <laughs> so are you inspired? All right, all right. So, so a little bit about our agency, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, our primary mission is to counter weapons of mass destruction and improvised threat networks. So we do that by employing a world-class STEM workforce. So I jokingly tell the kids that um, when I walk around the, the halls of my department, I'm the baby of the group, okay? I tell them I'm 23, they don't believe me, but for real, a good majority of our STEM workforce is soon to retire. So that's why we invest in these type of programs to kind of encourage and inspire our youth to take on these additional STEM academics so that they can one day take their place. With that, I'd like to bring up Mr. Eric Lorenstein, the Chief of Research Operations at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department. Mr. Lorenstein. Okay, how are we doing today? Great. Great. All right, let me start with the congratulations. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Um, my boss gives his regrets for not being able to come here, Dr. Ronald Han. Uh, he got pulled away. He's um, very upset not to be here. This program is uh, close and dear to his heart. Um, I can tell you with absolute certainty that he would have rather been here than where he was pulled to the Pentagon to talk about budgets and organizational structures and all those things that I find really boring, but he has to do them once in a while. He'd really rather be here. He loves talking about science. He loves talking to students. He loves talking about this program. Um, and he wanted to make sure that I talked to you about certain things today. So I can't do that without my glasses. <laughs> okay, how many of you have a sense of what you want to do with your life? And I'm, I'm talking mostly to the students. So let's see hands back there. I'm going to assume all the adults in the room would pretty much raise their hands, okay? So that's, that's not a fair question. You're all young. You still have time to think about that. And hopefully you are taking opportunities like this to think about that. Now, how many of you want to pursue a career in science? Let's see hands again. Yeah. Okay, most of you that are here, that's good. Um, what do you want to achieve with your life? You want to cure cancer? Maybe some yays, maybe some arms up in the back room. I mean, I think I'd like to cure cancer. I, I know I'm a little older. I've kind of started down a path, but I'd love to cure cancer. Um, maybe create a new form of travel. It helps you travel close to the speed of light. That was one of my big ones growing up. I always saw all the sci-fi movies, and I knew you couldn't get to Mars unless you went really, really fast. And so that was one of the things I wanted to do. Um, or maybe you just want to make the world a better place. And that's what... That's what we do at DITRA. That's our mission. Our goal is to make the world a better place. And we have a lot of different ways that we, in which we do that. Darnell and I, and even a few people in the audience, uh, work with the Chem Chemical and Biological Technologies Department, as Darnell mentioned. 
And so our job is to protect the nation from chemical and biological threats. Really nasty stuff, right? And I'm not going to talk about any of that because that would bring everybody down. It's really horrible stuff. Um, so how do you do that? I mean, it's a huge, horrible problem. Um, well, you do it with science. You have to figure out as much as you can about the nasty stuff that's out there. You figure out how it works. And then you learn and figure out ways to combat it. Well, if you can do that, you can certainly make the world a better place. We can protect you, your families, the soldiers, airmen and women, sailors, uh, who am I leaving out, Marines. We can protect everybody in this great country by learning to counter the threat. And Dr. Han, um, Dr. Han always says, we win, we protect this nation by outsciencing our enemies. And what does he mean by that? And I won't ask anybody because this is a big crowd, you won't hear each other. But what he means is, if we can do science better than everyone else, better than our enemies, we can be prepared to take on the threats that they throw at us. So that's what we at DITRA do. We try and outscience the enemy, come up with things faster than they can come up with the bad things. And we do that just to make the world a better place. So we don't do it with guns or bombs. You know, even though we're the Department of Defense, that's what you think about, weapons and guns. We do it with science. So that makes me feel really good, right? And it's really cool that we get to attack a problem like this that's so nasty um, with science, something that you know, a lot of us love and we've been doing all our lives. Uh, so Dr. Han, as I mentioned, regrets being here. But in a, in a way, I'm glad he couldn't be here because I feel very privileged to be here today. I grew up uh, being very interested in everything science. I used to look for opportunities like this. And I won't say how many years ago, but a while back, there weren't many opportunities like this at all. I had to really seek out a camp or anything like this where I could study science. I was a little extreme as a kid. I basically wanted to get involved in anything I could in the science area, even from five or six. My parents used to talk to me about uh, things that they would read and be interested in, and it just got me really interested in science. Um, I used to read a lot about Einstein. I used to read Isaac Asimov's books, which are amazing. If you haven't read any of them, you should start. Um, and Sorry. And not having a lot of opportunities, what I did from the ages of 5 to 10 was I started taking apart small appliances, right? And probably there are some people in here that have science careers that used to do that. And from 5 to 10, I probably took apart every small appliance in my parents' house. From 5 to 10, I probably broke every small appliance in my family's house. There were I think I can remember more than one occasion where I would be huddled in the corner of a room, blanket over my head, flashlight usually in my mouth because the blanket made it kind of dark, and I'd be tinkering with something and my parents would know that it got quiet in the house and they'd come looking for me because they'd be worried and they'd throw the blanket off my head and they'd see their favorite radio in a hundred different pieces. Because when you start taking things apart, you start unscrewing things, you start unprying covers, and you see more and more interesting parts, and you start unscrewing those and unprying covers. And one thing I was really good at was taking those things apart. One thing I was really bad at is putting them back together again. So my parents were constantly buying new small appliances, because um, they never learned their lesson. And they were also constantly looking for things like this to send me to, right? Because if I was out there, I was kind of somebody else's problem, learning about all these things that I wanted to learn about. So as I said, there weren't a lot of examples like this, but I did get to go to a few things. And that got me to kind of focus myself. Instead of just taking things apart and wondering how things worked and trying to figure them out myself, I realized you could study. You could do experiments. You could research. You could talk to other people. And that's really what science is about. Now, when I went back to school, uh, when I went to school, I studied a lot of math and physics. That's what I found I was kind of good at. And I studied and I studied. And I won't say I, you know, I, well, I was a nerd, a geek, whatever you want to call me. Um, but I still got to play soccer. I played football in high school. Um, I had lots of extracurricular activities, lots of friends. So I still managed to do that and do well in school. And I went to college and I studied math and physics some more. And when I got out of college, I went to work for I actually work, went to work for 
commerce first. I worked for a company called Circuit City. So that, again, <laughs> tells you a little bit of how old I am. Um, Circuit City is no longer around for the younger folks in the room. Um, but they used to build electronics, and I was in their corporate headquarters. Um, and we were doing planning and trying to figure out what electronics would sell and kind of mathematical-based things, analysis. Um, but then I went to work for a Navy defense contractor. And immediately, I got to work on actual rocket science. So uh, my job was to look at the insides of rockets and figure out different ways of moving materials in them to make them go faster and farther on the same amount of fuel. So that's pretty cool, right? Um, people always talked about doing rocket science. Here I was with a simple degree in math and physics, and I was doing rocket science right out of school. Uh, but I just craved learning, and I wanted to learn more, so I went back to school. I got a degree in material science, and then I moved up to DC and started working for another defense contractor. And within a few years, I came to work at DITRA as a government employee. And uh, because of my math background, DITRA had me building models and tools that would help the government understand how to build equipment to protect against, again, chem bio threats. Uh, so I was in software development, mathematics, analysis, trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, just last year, I got my current role, which is, uh, Dr. Han likes to call me his chief of staff or chief of operations. Basically, I manage the day-to-day -day operations of his 100 staff. Well, his 100 staff are chemists, biologists, technologists, engineers, roboticists, uh, microbiologists, everything, every science you could name uh, within these hundred folks and contractor teams of a, of a hundred or two more. And so now instead of just working on one area, I actually get to see all of these different areas and I get to talk to people about all the different science they do. And yes, there's a little math and physics in there and I get to comment and give them feedback on parts of that, but I get to see so much and I get to explore and see new things all the time. And that's, that's the best thing about my job right now. So I get to see science all day and all different kinds, and I'm learning all that time. So you guys all have that same opportunity if you stick with it. Um, there are so many different things you can do if you pursue scientific fields. Uh, maybe this is just your first step, maybe it's your second, uh, but the Department of Defense STEM program is really important. Now if our, goals, if our goal is to outscience the enemies, we can only do that if we have the best, smartest, and brightest scientists. This just the event is a really important one, and I'm going to read from my notes here because I don't want to get the numbers wrong because I'm a mathematician and that's important to me. <laughs> this year we hosted eight high school teachers from six states, including DC, uh, along with DC and Guam, 36 high school students from 18 states and DC, 32 middle school students from 16 states and DC. Some of our students have come from US posts overseas in Turkey, South Korea, Germany, and Italy. This year was our first year also conducting a JSTI event in the western part of the US in New Mexico, where we engaged another 46 students and teachers. And this brings our total to almost 440 students and 60 teachers participating in JSTI since 2012. And that's really awesome um, that we've been able to engage so many students and teachers for this program. Uh, but really, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We want to take this further. We want to take this bigger. We want to infect as many uh, students as we can with the science bug. Um, and we want you talking about how great this is and how great science is to your friends. And with their friends and their friends, we can get lots of students learning science, getting science degrees, uh, and working for the government in science. Uh, now, I'm probably n not going to say anything you don't already know. I probably haven't said much that you don't already know already. Um, but let me start with something really simple. Science is really important, right? I don't see any gasps. I don't see anybody running for the, for the doors. Um, in a way, being scientific is one of the most important and wild things about just being human. We explore. We ask questions. We often try to do anything we can to figure out answers. We poke, we prod, we draw, we build. We think, we think, we think, we think. Uh, sometimes we add things up, and we write things down. We come together and we share them. We talk about them, we fight about them, we argue about them, we argue about the best way to do things. We compete against each other. Uh, we try to figure out what each other is doing. We go back and we work a lot more and we think a lot more and we do more science and then we come together and we share it again. 
and down the road you end up with a meal and a pill or a phone that can tell you when you're sick. Uh, maybe someday a vehicle that can travel close to the speed of light. So there's no telling where we can go if we all keep, if, if more and more of us get into the, get the science bug. Um, so switching gears a little bit, as you move ahead and grow and learn, let me also implore you to consider working for the government. Uh, there are a lot of myths about working for the government. One of the longest and oldest was that we don't make much money. <laughs> so contrary to what Darnell just said, it's really not true. Um, it has been my experience, and I've been doing this for 15 years, that government jobs pay pretty much equally to jobs in industry, uh, to the similar jobs in industry. Um, true, you're, you might not, while you're a government employee, uh, run a Fortune 500 company and make $10 million and have a $30 million balloon and all of that. Um, but you're going to make good money, especially in a STEM field, because it's one of the highest areas of, of government pay. Um, another thing is the government is really, really stable. Um, and some people say that and, you know, oh, that sounds boring, it's stable. What it means is when you get a job and you find something that you like doing, no one's going to come along and tell you, oh, you're not doing that anymore, right? Um, within the government, there are lots of opportunities to move around. The government is so big um, that when a priority ends and they want to, let's say, move specialists out of an area, there are usually lots of different areas that those specialists can contribute to and, and, and find new work in. And that doesn't take getting fired and hired. Um, we just move around a lot in the government. It's very flexible. Benefits are great. Um, people are always talking that's kind of the one saving grace that's always uh, that's been consistent, that everybody talks about the great benefits. Again, because the government is so big, like Walmart or Google or Amazon, they're able to really provide um, kind of economies of scale when it comes to benefits. So we have lots of options for 401k investment plans and insurance plans and uh, medical benefits. Um, so benefits are great. And really, um, it's really hard to find a company that has benefits as great as the government. So uh, we have a lot of choices. Um, there's a lot of modern things that, that people find in jobs today that the government has really taken a hold of the last few years. For example, telecommuting. Telecommuting is working from home, right? Uh, in my office, there I don't know if there's anybody that doesn't telecommute from home at least one day a week. Some people more than that. Um, depending on your, your schedule, you know, if you're off at meetings somewhere one day, you might telework the, the rest of the half of the day. So there's a lot of tele telecommuting, which is, is really nice. Um, kind of allows you to not get so dressed up and you can really think in a different environment. Um, another thing, there's the dress code is not nearly as bad as it used to be. You see me without a tie here today. This is how I normally go to work. Usually I don't even have the jacket on. I'm pretty comfortable at work. Um, Darnell, you'll see him in a tie a lot because um, he likes to look a little sharper than me. Um, <laughs> But you know, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna wear shorts and flip-flops, although we did have a picnic two weeks ago where that's what everybody was wearing, um, and some of us managed to come back to the office that way. Um, but basically, it's just become much more flexible working for the government, and I really encourage people to consider that and not just think, oh, they don't make enough money or something, um, because a lot of those myths aren't true. So now, I want to thank all of the participants. I know Darnell did that already, but I really want to thank you. Um, I think this program is really important. Um, I hope this week you came to the realization that science can be fun uh, and really interesting. Um, not all science is about equations and formulas. It's really about observing the world, performing experiments, and problem solving. Those are really the basis of discovery and the scientific process, and they can be lots of fun. I think immersing yourselves in the science is going to be both rewarding and stimulating for you. Uh, whatever path you take, um, whether it's government or an industry um, or whatever you do in your life, remember that the federal government wants to see you excel and we hope you'll think about a scientific field uh, with us someday. I also want to take a moment to thank the teachers participating. 440 students is a great start. But I know I've heard Darnell use the term this, year, this week, uh, force multiplier, right? For every student we have at a, an event like this, that's great. It's one student, hopefully, where 
were affecting their life and giving them another choice to get into a scientific field to help out the country. Uh, but every teacher here is going to go on to teach and mentor and work with students all over the country. And, and that's going to keep going throughout their career. So we hope we're giving you the tools to do that um, and have success. Uh, I want to thank the parents for encouraging your kids and, and letting them come here. Uh, we really appreciate it. I can speak on the behalf of the whole crew here. We, we've really loved your kids for the last week or two. Um, looked, uh, look forward to doing it again. Uh, I also want to thank the mentors that have come from CC. We do change our names a lot in the government, so forgive me here, but CCDCCBC uh, and ICD. Uh, I know you guys have a job and you have expect expectations back home, but we really appreciate your taking the time out to help us here. Um, I want to thank Darnell for coordinating all of this. Thank you, Darnell. <laughs> um, Darnell does a great job putting these together. Um, we've been doing these for a few years, and he's had other folks involved. But this year, um, with, with O-Rise, he's pretty much coordinated it single-handedly, and he's done a great job. Um, last but definitely not least, I know you're all way back there. Maybe you can't even hear me. I, you haven't given me that many signs. Um, but let me congratulate you for completing your, your course the last week or two. Uh, maybe I should say almost completing, because I know we have one more step today. Um, but, but congratulations on completing your JSTI adventure. Um, I hope you all loved it. Uh, I got to see some great work over the last week, and I'm really looking forward to seeing more. Uh, keep exploring, all right? And that's all I have to say. Darnell? Thanks. He didn't seem nervous at all, did he? He just rocked it out there. So uh, Mr. Lowenstein gave me credit for organizing this whole thing, and I can't, I can't take the credit for it. The JSTI staff, they rocked, OK? They were straight lit, <laughs> if you will. But no, I'm just the guy in the background. They deserve all the applause, and I'm going <laughs> to give them all I can give them, OK? So next, I'd like to bring Mr. William Bosberg. He's a director for the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education to the microphone. Good morning to everyone. Uh, what a great event. This is my third year here. I'm uh, the director of the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education. Uh, I'll just take just a few minutes to say congratulations to the students, and I realize you are sitting all in the back. Uh, thank you to the parents or the mentors or whoever got you here. Last year when I was speaking uh, to this group, I challenged each one of the students to go back and personally thank the person that got you here, whether that was a neighbor, a relative, a friend, a teacher, and so on. And I did a little caveat. I basically said, do not email them and don't instant message them. Try to find them personally or by a telephone and look them in the eye and just say thank you. That was a great event. Um, so this event is very important to us. It's very important to DOD. I know uh, the group that uh, Marie runs, Marie Westfall, uh, deserves a round of applause for all the ORISE staff, so could we give them a round of applause? <laughs> so Eric had mentioned uh, jobs. I know most of you are in junior high or high school, so you may not be thinking about that, but we in the Department of Energy, uh, the DOE ORISE program is very active in placing STEM talent in national laboratories. So what does that mean? Right now we have almost 10,000 students at undergrad levels, graduate and postdoctoral levels placed in national labs. There's 17 Department of Energy national laboratories. And the idea is to find STEM talent, recruit it, and get all of you, when you get to that point, out to the labs to work with mentors. So you've worked with mentors here, you've worked with teachers here, that's a nice transition while you're in college, either undergraduate or graduate school. So we'll be looking for you in the future. Keep that in mind. Uh, the ORISE program can help you move to the next level of your lab work and your STEM education. So uh, thanks to you. Thanks to Eric Darnell. This is such a great program. I want to give special uh, attention to everybody in the room, whether your parents, friends, or otherwise. Thank you for being here. Having that support system for these kids is very important. And I'm looking forward to the robots uh, beating each other up here. So thank you very much.
Alrighty, at this time, I'd like to bring a special guest to the microphone, Mr. Dale Taylor, one of the founders of this program. So, Dale Taylor, come on up. You know, come up and stay there. Is this working? Good. So I'll make it real quick. Uh, Darnell, this has been a great event. I've been following it on social media for the last two weeks. It's been wonderful. And I'm going to make this real short. Uh, I wasn't planning on coming today, but when I found out that someone I consider a dear friend is retiring, I couldn't miss it. Marie, can you join me for a second? She hates the attention. She really does. But Marie and I go back to before 2012 planning the first JSTI, and I will tell you une unequivocally, if it hadn't been for Marie, the first one wouldn't have happened. The second one wouldn't have happened, okay? Because she was the driving force behind the scenes to make all this possible. Uh, guiding us as we were trying to find our way on the DOD side to make, these th make this event happen. She brought a lot of enthusiasm and inspiration that rubbed off on us. And I can tell you that for myself, Darnell, and Morgan, we truly appreciate it. And I can tell you from the hundreds of kids that I know that they are appreciative. And Marie's retiring in September, and I just found out two days ago she's retiring. So I don't have a gift for it, but I will be in Knoxville or in Oak Ridge when she retires in September to give you your gift. But I just wanted to acknowledge how much we appreciate and truly love what you've done for us, for the program, and for us personally. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, JSTI on your feet. Give a round of applause on your feet, JSTI. Thank you, thank you. So now we'll take this time to move into the individual presentations from each of our research groups. Uh, who do we have first up? Robotics competition. Be prepared to be amazed. <laughs> okay, good morning. So. Here we have our robotics competitions going to take place. Um, if you can see, there's a track set up. Um, we have orange footballs, which those, if you get into the corner where your robot is, are worth three points. Though if you move the green balls into someone else's corner, those are negative one points. So we don't want those. Um, at the end of the competition, which will last approximately two minutes and 30 seconds, um, if your robot makes it all the way back into your corner, you get eight points, which is a significant number. Um, uh, we have to have 30 seconds of coding where it is fully autonomous, you cannot touch it. And after that, we're free to control it ourselves. So, here you go.
All right, morning, everybody. My name is Adel Brumbuth. My name is Jordan Otello. I'm Isabella Robinson. I'm Joseph Purvis. I'm Maya Cabrera, and we are part of the 3D Printing and Design Group. These past two weeks, we have worked on creating auto open source robots. These robots are fully personalized. So during our past two weeks, we had the opportunity to work with four different types of 3D printers. The most expensive printer we used was called the Stratasys and has the capability to simultaneously print with two different colored filaments. We also used the Ultimaker 3, the Lulzbot Mini, and the Creality. Last week, we decided we want to, wanted to experiment with different printing materials. So we decided to use ABS, PLA, and a flexible filament called Cheetah or Ninja Flex. Because we wanted our robots to be rigid, we decided to use PLA. All right, so the goal of this project was to optimize the best design for a 3D printed robot. And we did this through a process called additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is the combination between uh, 3D printing and robotics. So here you can see a couple of pictures of like high-end additive manufacturing. We have um, metal, we're, um, they're metal, and we have them 3D printing over there. And okay, so additive manufacturing is the, st is the stepping stones to the future as the combination between 3D printing and robotics will like allows for an ease of access to, um, uh, for the future. So the building process for the auto robot started with circuitry, 3D printing, and coding. We 3D printed the, the whole body for the robot, which included the head, torso, legs, feet, and hands. The Autobot came into a kit, which included all the parts that we were going to be utilizing to make it operate, including the servos, the circuitry, sorry, the circuitries, the Arduino, and the Arduino uh, shield. The assembly, it started with 3D printing the torsos, the heads, the feet, the buttons, the hands, and also the, so, and also the uh, torso as well. The circuitry included the um, power button for the servos, the power button for the ser um, sensors, and also the power button for the ser servos for the hands and feet as well to make the robot move and dance. Continuing with the circuitry, the next step was coding the, the bots. So we used um, Arduino, which uses a form of C++. And we primarily just modified what was already existing within the um, kits that we used. So it, we, they were able to dance and sing. So the auto robot provided a great base for our project, but its design was not optimal for our goals. So we customized it. The legs at, were too small, so we tried a different set, which didn't allow us to screw in our larger servos, so we had to change those once more. And we customized it for our goals in that we wanted our robot to be able to pick up something to perform a simple task, but the robot we had had no arms, so we had to design a 
second torso piece to fit over the first and 3D printed arms and then code those. After that, we also customized our robots to give them more character. So they weren't just all the same thing. So we, we printed several hats, a cowboy hat, a bowler hat, some masks and glasses. Lastly, we took our uh, robot's insides and we made a whole new body for it. This is the auto quad, and so it has the same insides as the other robots, except for a few extra servos for its extra limbs, but different body and different functions. We had very many struggles while trying to complete the robot and add on to it, such as the arms. We did not have any of the libraries to put into the robot that would make the arms work. So we were going off on our own trying to um, figure out how to incorporate the two programs together. So some other struggles that we had were with the um, 3D printing design itself. As Joseph stated previously, we did not have the arm design and we had to work uh, on prototyping for legs as well. And as you can see on the picture on the left, that's actually a hat that I tried to print and failed at least two or three times. So, but after, and also a big problem that we had was with our button. So the button on these robots were not, did not fit all the way through in the design that we were given. So we had to design our own button system with a two pins and a, and a little like carrier case for it. Um, in conclusion, uh, give me a second. In conclusion, uh, the combination of 3D printing and robotics is the future as the ease of access to printers and the materials that we use in the printers are far easier than the processes that we have today. While it may seem, my, while it may have some drawbacks, like the time length that it takes to make for um, bigger builds, we believe that additive manufacturing and processes like it can help, um, can help uh, push us to the future to a brighter and easier future where we all can live in a technology-filled world. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank the um, LJ Holmes, our mentor on this, the University of Delaware, ORISE, DITRA, DOD, the APG for hosting us on a field trip, and all the people who worked at the JSDI program to give us this opportunity. We'd also like to take, thank Jim Taylor for driving us 30 minutes each day to the University of Delaware. Big shout out to him. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs> Lastly, now that we're leaving, the they're gonna sh there's going to be a video showing kind of what we did all week, so please enjoy that. So I'm Jim Taylor, and I'm with the 3D Printing and Design Group. This kind of project was broken up into two phases. The first phase, the students printed 3D printed bodies for a robot that came um, off of a, a Tinkercad. And they took that robot and they installed the electronics in it and then programmed the, uh, the robot to do a dance to Smooth Criminal or Single Ladies. That was just to get them exposed to 3D printing initially and also how to do some of the programming for the robotics that they uh, to, to accomplish the end goal for Phase 2. Uh, so then for Phase 2, what they're working on right now is developing a robot using the same uh, prototypes that they used before. But now they're going to add arms to the robot so that it'll actually lift up an object. And that's the, the end goal is to program this robot to accomplish an actual task, not just dance around and, and play music. It's 30 and 38, 30 and 36. I think the thing that I most enjoy about this is the struggles that we've had. Like, we've had certain struggles with the buttons and the wirings of, and fitting everything inside the tiny shell of the robot. I think working through that was the most fun for me. Morning. I'm Kathleen Dwyer, and I'd like to share how microscope histotechniques can compare. For when living creatures get sick or they die, science is used to help identify exactly what caused the harmful effect, from large to small factors, quite hard to detect. But with our bare eyes, we can only see the effects that impact gross anatomy. So if much greater detail is aspired, then some type of microscopy is required. Your eyes can only distinguish so low to about 0.2 millimeters or so. An optical scope collects light that's around and makes it through several lenses rebound. When very small objects are thus magnified, its tiniest features can be identified. But humans cannot zoom in infinitely. The wavelength of light limits what we can see. 
Electron microscopy uses a beam of fast-moving electrons focused in stream, which strike down a surface, creating a scene of high and low atoms and those in between. The image produced shows a picture in gray of where in the sample the structures do lay. So when use electron, when optics with light, one needs to select the tool that is right. A light microscope will not cost too much money, but electrons are hundreds of thou, it ain't funny. With light microscopy, you get what is paid for. Electron scopes magnify hundreds times more. For whatever magnification you care, your specimen tissue one first must prepare. Right after collection, your sample must fix into a cassette where it's centered and sticks. Then alcohol's added, followed by benzene, dehydrating tissue and making it clean. An embedding agent like paraffin wax makes a block of tissues in a supporting matrix. The sample's now ready for partitioning. A microtome does the precision slicing. The sharp edge is pressed to the sample within, carving off a piece that is ultra thin. Each slice that's produced of the wax and the tissues connects to the prior slice made as it issues, creating a ribbon of slices that float on the water surface. Next, you'll devote attention to grabbing a piece on a slide, then letting it rest till the piece is all dried. The final step's adding a good staining dye, which helps provide contrast for the naked eye and clarifies features in optical scope, providing the insight for which you did hope. Showing the structure of each single cell, control ones, and those that are damaged as well. Usually, this enlargement is sufficient, but for things like junctures, the site is deficient. An electron scope is needed for viewing, a parallel process for prep you'll be doing. Dehydrating, cleaning, then resin in bed with OSO4 staining dark where it's lead. The tip of the sample is carefully prepared, removing the resin until just samples there. A diamond is what up against it abuts to slice off the end into ultrafine cuts. And like with the light scope, a watery moat collects tiny slices upon which they float. Then this minute raft, one has to retrieve. This step is so tricky, it's hard to believe. Under magnification, with tweezers in hand, one has to wade into the miniature land and onto a screen on this small copper ring, scoop up and center a piece on this thing. The sample is placed in microscope tube, a space in which all of the air's been removed. The vacuum provides exactly what's needed, so the path of the electron beam's not impeded. The surface emits a range of energy, producing a detailed image you see. This week has been great, for it's given to me the chance to try new kinds of microscopy. I have always used optical, but electron, nope. A high school can't afford a six-figure scope. I've also seen how tissue samples prepared, a process of which I was not well aware. To create a picture with good clarity, one makes a solution of the right molarity to determine if parts like water or not, to tell if the dye soaks a little or lot. Dyes attach differently to different parts. Picking the right one means you've got the smarts. So when next week to my school I return, I'll share with my students the things I did learn. One central message I saw shining through was teamwork's essential in all that you do. Nicole, Denise, Tracy, they each had a role working together to achieve their goal. Additionally, I will bring back for each kid the relative size of the things that I did. Molecules, cells, these things are so small and my students do not understand scale at all. Comparative sizing for them is conveyed when they sort out the things in the lesson I made. The teachers I made here, I appreciate. Eudina's my roommate, has really been great. Juanita always checks that our group is okay and her first baseball game was on her birthday. Cindy was happy to share daily news while Sergio's mad ninja skills did amuse. Paul told us all about his Guam life and UPS men followed Barbie to wife. Mike made a new friend and then he killed him? Don't fret, it was just an eclair he called Tim. For late night relaxing at the Applebee, did we drink Mai Tais? The answer is C. And Ed, as our dad, drove us all kinds of places, labs and great restaurants where we stuffed our faces. We enjoyed the zoo at Washington, D.C. and African-American history. This amazing two weeks has quickly flown by. My thanks to the people of JSTI.
3D printing is an innovative way of designing newer old things. This technology will make building and creating much easier. With its up and coming influence of technology, it will peak an interest in many kids, which will give and open up many future jobs. Um, 3D printing is a fairly recent technology that is still being rapidly expanded on. Our class was about learning the basics of 3D printing. However, we looked into the real life applications as well, um, and in that it was more than just 3D printing, as well as the post-processing as well. That was very important in this class. 3D printing traces back to the 1980s with Hideo Kadama, who created the first rapid prototyping device, as well as Charles Hull, who made the first ever 3D printed object using a printing style called SLA, also known as stereolithography. So the, print, the, the type we used was FDM, that, was, that is seen in printers made by Joseph Prusa. In 2017, he released the Prusa i3 Mark III printer that will be shown here in just a second. He started small in 2012 and has grown big ever since then. <laughs> Sorry. Um, unlike SLA, FDM, known as fused deposition modeling, releases a melted thermal plastic that becomes solid when it cools with the air. His printers are said to be the easiest and most well adopted by hobbyists and manufacturers. We Before. mainly use this printer for printing. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Before operating any 3D printer, it is ideal to test its calibration before printing any prototypes. We do this by downloading, slicing, and printing a pre-made SEL file. Depending on the quality of the print, it will reveal any errors in which we will then fix. This here is, shown as, is known as a Benchy. A Benchy is one of the most popular test prints that are used to see if the printer is correctly calibrated. During our initial stages of printing, we printed a variety of Benchies. Using a program called Tinkercad, we were able to modify it and add the JST highlighters. The figures shown are known as flexi animals. This particular group of prints were used to experiment with different filaments. Printing these figures was a great way to introduce us to the class and help familiarize ourselves with the software and hardware used. To create these gear type machines, we found the type we liked off the internet, which then we transferred to a Prusa slicer to fit to the size we desired. The outcomes as seen we got were amazing. Sophia made a circular box that opens and closes, and they made a predator claw, while Press and I created gear shifting cubes. So to understand post-processing, we conducted an experiment uh, by printing nine identical Batmans uh, and applying a smoothing technique to them. So we, um, the objective of this experiment was to find out like what we can do with the print after the print is placed. So here, we spray painted each of the Batman silver so we can carefully observe the details within it. So the methods we used were sanding, small layer height, XTC, clear coat, filler primer, uh, vapor smoothing with acetone and IPA and normal primer. And the most tedious method was sanding for us. And here we have the control alongside with the most, smooth, most smoothest model which was the XDC, and XDC is a two-part epoxy used for coating self-levels and wets out uniformly without leaving brush strokes. So here's Preston, and he's gonna talk about the tire project, uh, which we did on a free design software called Onshake. During this project, we were giving a task to design a tire using a CAD software called Onshake. The requirement for this project was to use dimensions that would fit around a number two pencil the goal was to have the wheel, the wheel roll as smoothly as possible. Here shown is a before and after picture of our tar design. The figure displayed is a picture showing all of the students' final print of their tar design. Michael Guy, who is our mentor, stuck a number two pencil through the tar to test its durability and efficiency of the design. Using a thermoplastic polyurethane filament, we were able to make the wheels yield easily to pressure and weight. Um, our final for this class involved making our own design based on a customer's demand, our customer being Jennifer Tyrell, who requested a double phone case that she could hold at work. This final product taught us about real life situations that can be applied to 3D printing. Sophia and Anae came up with a clasp design to meet Jennifer Tyrell's ideal phone case. This phone case will connect and disconnect from a looped wire. This makes the two different kinds of phone able to easily attach. They also added a thick wall to give a protest protective aspect to the phone. While Press and I's ideal idea was to make the back of the phone case a railroad locking system, but due to lack of time, so settled for a Velcro attachment. We also made an hourglass shaped button on the sides to fit to create a purse-like feature. All these features are gonna make our consumer happy. These are representations of our prototypes. Using the materials available to, make our, to create our phone, we use a polyacidic acid. For the case in a final print, we would use NinjaFlex and polyacidic acid. 
Now we would like to present the amazing student videography video of our time in mechanical printing. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Michael Guy. I am the mentor for the Advanced Mechanical Prototyping Group. Our class designs and 3D prints mainly, uh, various mechanical designs. Some different colors up there, there's gonna be some blue, some red, you know. Gonna make That's awesome. I want my students to pick up various design methodologies that we use throughout engineering, including 3D design and computer-aided design software, CAD, uh, design for manufacturing, design for the environment, and, and full life cycle assessments. It's pretty cool. It, if you think about it, 3D printing is our future. They've started making cars out of 3D printers, machines, many things. So it's like preparing us for our future. Uh, I will say these students have picked things up amazingly fast. Uh, we've gotten through three or four weeks of material in a week and a half, so they keep me on my toes for sure. Good morning. On behalf of the Department of Defense, I'd like to thank JSAI Engineering for their willingness to participate in solving our current challenge. We are asking you to develop a method to reach a soldier in the field, determine if they have been exposed to a chemical agent, and retrieve the soldier for treatment. Good luck. We look forward to meeting you again in four weeks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ira. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. We are JSTI's middle school forensic chemistry team. Hello, my name is Abigail Robertson. I'm from Cameron, North Carolina. This past week, we've been doing lab testing using qualitative analysis, which is when you use already known lab testing results to later identify an unknown substance. My name is Nalani Eccles, and I'm from South Carolina. And on Monday, we used qualitative analysis to identify white powders. We added reagents to observe the reaction of these known powders. We use those reactions to identify unknown white powders. On Tuesday, we had 27 liquid solutions that we tested for different reactions. We used a flame to excite the cations, which exerted a color. This allowed us to identify each solution. My name is Philip. I'm from Bossier, Louisiana, and we took a cool trip to a place called Sodron. Sodron is the county's largest waste processing plant. It can handle up to 50,000 gallons of wastewater per day. We were also taught about how water is treated. It uses both bacteria and chemical processes to purify the water, which is monitored in the laboratory, where we were able to see microbes and other cool tests. Hi, my name is Richard Bruce from the Muddy Banks of Wichita, and, <laughs> and I will be talking about how to identify cations and anions. Our group experimented with different cations and recorded observations to and used a centrifuge to separate decantants from precipitants. We identified solutions due to their chemical reactions and used that information to identify unknowns. And we used some of the chemicals to uh, um, change the colors of flames and looked at them through cobalt glass. Hi, y'all. It's Abby again. <laughs> Our task was to find rat poison on a variety of um, s surfaces. Hi, I'm Cameron Dickens from Puyallup, Washington. Uh, barium is a component of rat poison. Uh, to find barium, a component of rat poison, we need to take a swabbing device and swab a surface. And then we expose the device to a flame, causing a green-yellow flame to appear. And it should also be a green-yellow flame through a cobalt glass filter. Hi, my name is Jamia. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. And the substance we are testing is rat poison. And the ion carbonate is in rat poison. 
and it reacts with acetic acid to produce bubbles and foam, like in the pictures. Hello, I'm Liam from Frederick County, Maryland, and I'll be discussing the acetic acid delivery system. Uh, a vial of acetic acid will be placed on the arm of the robot and to be properly administered or introduced to the chemical using a spray bottle tip, and all of this will be live streamed to our observing station using a camera which will be mounted onto a swivel mount which will be atop the robot. Thank you. And next I think we have the 3B, 3D printing team. Hi, I'm Audrey Sa, and we are the 3D printing group. On the first day of camp, we did team building puzzles and some icebreakers to get to know each other so we could be a better group and have our project be better. My name is Gregory Schaefer, and I'm from DC, and I go to Capitol Day School, and I'm gonna tell you about our field trip to the CCBC Fab Lab. The CCBC Fab Lab is the Community College of Baltimore County, and we went there to see 3D printers and 3D printed materials. One of the interesting things we saw there was a 3D printed Taj Mahal. We thought it was really interesting because of how intricately detailed it was. And we saw many different like materials for creating and stuff like that. Hi, I'm Lilia Dalton. And on the third day, we created this robot. His name is Martin. And we all voted on one robot. And after all voting, we all, we created Martin and we tested him out. And at one point we also had to like redesign him because the weight wasn't really correct. Over the course of this week, we've done evening activities such as bowling and extreme water sports to like help us bond together. So when we had designed Martin, we, we went on this app called, or a website called Tinkercad, and we designed them. You design things with like shapes, and then you print it out, and we were just watching the printer like do layer by layer. 3D printing, how is it done? Our goal was to make a robot that was able to be sent to admin, administer a test for a chemical agent to a distressed soldier. The steps are as followed. Number one, to outline a design of the robot on paper, then we would move to a 3D model on Tinkercad, and then we would have to print the prototype, test the prototype, and then submit it for mass production. Outlining design to a robot is coming up with ideas and a plan for what you're going to build before you build it. It happens before printing, even designing, because you know what you're going to make to make something. For a robot, two students, Audrey and Lily, drew multiple designs of an old-fashioned robot they called Martin. Drawing and writing are often used to complete this step. After we had done the doodles for a robot, we had to design it on Tinkercad, which is a program where you design models and then share it with other people. When you're designing your models, you build them out of geometric shapes, which is what we did for Martin. Once you've designed your model on Tinkercad, you then have to slice it. Slicing is when you split your model into one millimeter layers. The reason you have to do this is because the printer is not able to comprehend a straight Tinkercad file. So once you've sprint, split it into one millimeter layers, you're then ready to print. 3D printers print in an XYZ format, which calculates length, width, and height. To print Martin, we had to download a design onto the printer. This lets the printer know a general idea of the size of the design. The amount of time that is taken to actually print something is calculated by the size of the product. After we 3D printed our robot, we ensured that uh, Martin had to do what he was supposed to do. So we tested his strength and a weight. 
we, as we edited the, the, the design, the original Martin, as we tested it, wasn't, the top weight was a little, um, a little underweight, so we added a little, like, you could say skirt, so the bottom weight was more equal with the testing. Once we had completed Martin, we had to submit him for mass production. Mass production is when many of the same thing is made, often very quickly, by machinery with minimal human involvement. If we mass produced Martin, we could have more of the robot to send to aid more soldiers. And next we will have the Raspberry Pi group. Hi, my name is Emily Kerr, and I'm from Manassas, Virginia. And this is the Raspberry Pi group. A Raspberry Pi is a small computer that connects to a computer monitor or TV and uses a standard keyboard and mouse. This week, we learned how to code using Python, and we used it to control LED lights using a breadboard, wires, and push buttons. We also learned how to use a piano hat as well as a sense hat, and the projects we made are a magic mirror and photo booth. Hello, my name is Tyler Kenny, and I'm from Howard Grace, Maryland. A magic mirror is a Raspberry Pi powered smart mirror. It is made out of a two-way acrylic mirror, a TV, wood, and a Raspberry Pi. We coded the Raspberry Pi to make the magic mirror show the time, weather, recent news, and um, comment, compliments. We, the magic mirror can show info while still serving as a mirror. We coded the Raspberry Pi using Python. Python is an open source computer language that is easy to learn and simple to use. My name is Justin Clark and I am from Washington, D.C. So we made this photo booth from cardboard, two buttons, a screen, of course, the Raspberry Pi. How it works is when you press this little red button right here, I'll then show you what the camera sees. And, and then once you're ready, you can press this button, and I'll then take the picture. We also used uh, Python to program the photo booth. Hello, my name is Sincere Russell, and I'm from California. Uh, me, uh, me and my group went on, a, to, went on a field trip to the University of, Del of Delaware to see, to see how we could, and how, and how we could use three, How, I, how we could program a uh, program 3D printed robots using a Raspberry Pi. During our time at the University of Delaware, we saw students uh, working, uh, working on the 3D printed robots by using programming and coding. Also during this time, we saw a display for a search and rescue robot that used the Raspberry Pi and centers, and centers as its components. My name is Nadia Williams and I live in Woodridge, Virginia. This week using the Raspberry Pi to help us figure out how to help this soldier. In order to help this soldier, we need sensors on our robot to figure out the chemical agent. The, sensor, the main sensors needed are a motion sensor, a camera, a speaker and microphone, and other sensors. Hello, my, my name is Alexander James. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, my job is to talk about the communication system. The goal of the communication system is to establish that the robot is an ally and not an enemy. Uh, the robot will have a link between the command, the control center, or something like that, and the robot, and they'll also have a speaker so the people from the command center can speak to the, the soldier, and uh, they can uh, walk him through, taking a sample, and calm his nerves, if he has any. My name is Simon Mellon, and I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. My job in this hypothetical project was to uh, take samples and perform tests to 
um, hopefully understand what chemical agent was used. My name is Lauren Brooks, and I'm from Erie, Colorado. And our plan is to then take the sample and send it to command center so it can be tested on and so that we can save the soldier. And now the drones group. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samantha Muha. In order to succeed in pretty much anything, you need two things, cooperation and teamwork. On Sunday, we each got a slip of paper that was part of a bigger puzzle we had to talk to each other to put together to figure out what group, group we were in. We're in the drone group. Later that day, we went to water sports and kayaked in teams of two. We had to talk to each other so we wouldn't go in circles. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Escamilla. We started our second day by going to Hartford Community College, where we discussed the history and many applications of a drone. We then spent our time practicing flying a drone using the Parrot Mambo drone, which I'm pretty sure is haunted because somehow, every single time I fly it, it seems to find its way into a bush. <laughs> Anyways, after that, we took our drones back inside and tried to program them using Tinker to fly in a simple pattern like a triangle. It was actually really hard, but by the end of the day, our patterns worked almost 100% of the time. Hello, my name is Seth Bacons, and day three was awesome. So on day three, we analyzed the problems and discussed um, the possible solutions. And the result of us working as a, on the team, um, we were able to narrow down eight of the original designs to four. And at the end of the morning, we gathered materials to we gathered materials to build the four designs. And after lunch, we just tested the four designs to, to finalize the solution. And we were um, tested by um, Mark and Jeff by the obstacle course. My name's Tyler Hurdle, and on Wednesday, we went, went to on a field trip to the Smithsonian Museum of Air and Space, where we learned about the history of aviation, from the Wright brothers to the space shuttle. Then we learned about the challenges and successes leading to our modern capabilities. We additionally, we were exposed to the history of the Apollo 11 mission, this being its 50th anniversary. Our knowledge of this great accomplishment was only furthered by the Apollo 11 IMAX movie. We then explored the museum and watched our fantastic planetarium show. Um, my name is Jewel, and all this hard work that they did, it wouldn't work if we could have got the robot to the soldier. Hi everyone, I'm Kayo Huen. The first part of designing our solution was individually brainstorming ideas to pick up the soldier. Each person drew their own label diagram that they thought they could use to solve the problem with. We used materials such as pipe cleaners, paper clips, clothespins, magnets, magnet tape, scissors, popsicle sticks, and toy soldiers to create the product with. After we created the product, we tested it multiple times and decided which one we wanted to use as our final product. Here are the designs that were made. These are our four key designs, the ones that worked the best. The first one is the hook and loop. We put a hook onto the drone and a loop onto the soldier, which didn't work very well. The soldier kept falling over, so we decided to reverse that. We put the hook onto the soldier and the loop onto the drone, which worked, but the soldier was too top heavy, it kept tipping over. So we decided to take another look at it, and we came up with a sticky cocoon, which is what it sounds like. It stuck to the drone, but it made the drone impossible to fly. We could not fly it. So we came up with another idea by putting a magnet onto the drone and onto the soldier, which was our final product. Hi, I'm Annalise Bunger, and first we started off by connecting the robot to the drone by using a loop on the robot and a hook on the drone. Once they were connected, we would fly the robot out to the infect possibly infected soldier, where the robot was programmed by the Raspberry Pi group to do forensic chemistry. Once the robot was done doing all its tests, we would connect the soldier to the drone by using a magnet 
on the soldier and a metal hook on the drone. Then we would fly the soldier out to the field hospital where it would be fatherly examined. <clears throat> Lastly, we'd like to thank the DOD for providing money and without their help, um, we don't want to be given this opportunity. And during this week, we did challenges and circling STEM. That's it. Hello, I'm Riley Boylan. I'm Hannah Rowe. I'm Mara Sweeney. I'm Ella Wilde. I'm Logan Zeiss, and this is the Environmental Water Quality Research Group, also known as Dub Q. Currently, there are so many ongoing efforts trying to improve the water quality of many waterways, including the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. Throughout these two weeks, we collected 11 water samples in areas of high human activity and tested back for nitrates, phosphates, ammonia, pH, and dissolved oxygen. Our first field trip was to the Sod Run Wastewater Treatment Plant. They took us through their entire process, which begins with removing solid waste, before it goes through several microbial processes to remove the excess nitrates and phosphates. Their water comes in with very dangerous levels of these that they get down to the regulated amounts. We took a sample of their effluent, which is the treated water they send back out, and a sample from the Bush River. Even though these sources were only about 20 feet from each other, we were really interested to see the differences in their nitrates, phosphates, ammonia, pH, and dissolved oxygen content. The next day we went to Annapolis Harbor to go out on the water with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We went sailing on their skipjack to multiple locations on the bay, collecting water samples, learning the history and about the ecosystem and wildlife, as well as how we all impact the health of the bay. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation is an organization dedicated to saving the bay and restoring it to good health. They conduct research, head cleanup efforts, and educate the public and legislators. And they've concluded that over the past few years, the bay's health is slowly improving. On the boat, we tested water at various spots for many different things, such as turbidity, pH, temperature, salinity, nitrates, and phosphates, um, which are also big indicators on how the health of the bay is doing. We also had an opportunity to collect oysters, crabs, and fish. Um, the oysters were collected and put into a tub of water from the bay, and we watched how they uh, cleaned the water and how they were the ocean's filters, as long as we got close to some of the animals, made really good friends with them too. Our third and final field trip was to the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC. CERC leads research programs in areas around the Chesapeake Bay. They take what they learn and advise businesses and the governments on how to maintain the bay. We took our final samples on the shore and pier of the Road River. We also built ROVs, or remotely operated vehicles, which we use to measure light and water temperature. ROVs are used in aquatic habitats all over the world. For each of the tests that we did, the water would turn a different color if the macronutrients were present. All of these samples are from the sod run effluent, which still has noticeable levels of nitrates, phosphates, and ammonia. The first one is bright pink because of its high levels of nitrates. The next two are from the ammonia test. The yellow was a control made with deionized water, while the green one changed color because of its high ammonia content. The blue one is our phosphate test, and the last is a diluted retest of the nitrates because the original sample was out of the range that our machine could read. All the nitrate levels we observed were in a typical range which is good because too many nitrates can lead to eutrophication, algal blooms, and fish kills. The only sample out of this typical range was sod run because the water coming into sod run is saturated with these macronutrients, so they go through a complex microbial process to remove as many as possible. Ammonia has similar effects and can cause similar damage in high amounts. All of our tests were in a safe range, which is good because once again, it can cause all the things that nitrogen causes. Dissolved oxygen is necessary for all animals that breathe in the water. 
Too little, um, too little amount will distress or kill marine life. The minimum amount of dissolved oxygen needed to sustain life is three milligrams per liter. Luckily, all our samples were above that. This graph of the phosphate levels shows that all but two of our samples fell in ideal ranges. And as we mentioned before, Sodron had the highest ranges because before coming into treatment, they already had such high levels of these macronutrients. And after treatment, it was able to, and the fact that it was be able to get lowered to one milligram per liter is incredible, so it can be back go back to the Bush River. And all the pHs were around seven, so which is ideal for the base ecosystem to thrive. Throughout the two weeks, we were able to find that all most of the ammonium, phosphate, and nitrate levels were in safe ranges. And high human activity leads to increases, increased amounts of these macronutrients, but programs such as the Chesapeake Bay Foundation are working towards improving the water quality. And based on the tests that we took this year, the bay's health is improving based on what we have from five years ago and the data that we have collected. And last but not least, we would like to say thank you to our mentor, Dr. Morgan Minyard, our alumni, Kalila, and our RT, Terry Reeves. We would also like to thank Luis for taking all of our amazing pictures, Colt for driving us around, and the entirety of JSTI for putting on this program. We also want to say thank you to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Sod Run Wastewater Treatment Plant, and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, oh wait, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center for the amazing experiences and educational opportunities provided to us this week. Thank you to Hartford Community College um, for letting us use their facilities. And lastly, I want to thank DITRA and the DOD for sponsoring this event. And now our video that the videography group made. So this is water quality analysis. What they're doing is they're measuring certain nutrients uh, that you would find in the bay that could cause um, detrimental health to the overall ecosystem. So they're just trying to check the different levels um, and see how different man activities such as uh, wastewater treatment plants or urban development ends up affecting the overall quality of the bay. So they're using a Hawk spectrophotometer which uh, uses a, a light source and then different types of uh, kits with it that give it a coloration and then they're able to measure the variations in the color based off of the control. And then give them the readout. Right now we are testing our water samples that we took of the Chesapeake Bay of the Bush River in Swan Harbor. We are testing the pH levels, the nitrate levels, the phosphate levels, and I believe the nitrogen levels as well. We went to a wastewater center in Hartford County and we got our samples from the Bush River. Fluoride is uh, an iron containing compound. Yep. That's, that's chemically removed. I find every single year everybody gets a little bit smarter. And then actually, students have seen a lot of these techniques or learned uh, different terminologies that I've been introducing um, before they even come to the class. There is a door that you walk, that you unlock with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of wires, a dimension of loops, a dimension of robots. You're moving into a land of both man and machine, of metal and flesh. You've just crossed over into the robot zone. <laughs> Hello, my name is Whitney Dickens, and today we will discuss the evolution of robotics. Here behind me is I'm Nathan Bunger. Virginia Schaefer. They will exhibit the capabilities of robots over time. In the beginning, there was one, one joint, one function. They were simpler times, but times without freedom. 
Robots of this era were useful for simple, repetitive tasks, especially within factories. But this would not last long. I'm an example of a factory robot. I have one job, moving tires. The next generations were not as simple. These creations used more joints. More joints means more freedom. These robots could perform complex tasks, although still simple compared to modern robots. They were coded to perform several tasks and involved a significant amount of human involvement. I am a second generation robot, the Da Vinci robot. I have no corrective algorithm. He cannot think. He has no power to do anything for himself, so he will stay on the ground. <laughs> the generation of robots following those with coded options are those with partial autonomy. This autonomy stems from the inclusion of sensors into the control of actions. This is an example of the Boston Dynamics RoboDog. She has corrective algorithms and sensors. So when I push her, she can get back up. The final and most modern generations are those with machine learning. These robots can adapt from the mistakes of past generations. These robots, after generation upon generation, can become perfect in completing said tasks and may one day take over. We will not be pushed down. Attack. So now we're going to have a video made by our amazing videography group of our progress over the past two weeks. Uh, my name is Ethan and I was with the robotics group. So in robotics we had to, um, basically first off we built a thing called Wally, -E, and we were supposed to cut it together by itself and then with the controller. We, uh, we already got finished uh, tying the controller to it and uh, figuring out how to do it. And then we did a wireless. So far, it's been pretty difficult. Um, Coding's not as easy as I thought it was. And uh, it's fun. We have a good time. So. so the first thing I make them do is they have to come up with the design and draw a picture and come up with what functions it, they want the robot to be able to do, like have an arm to pick up balls or move balls or even hold balls sometimes. Um, so they have to come up with a design and then they go through the troubleshooting process that is building robotics and then at the end they come up with a coding element to start the competition with a 30 second code process before manual control. I'm Logan. I'm Julian. I'm Laura. I'm Mark. And I'm Carlene. Shipping is rough. We all know somebody who has been a victim of, or we've been a victim ourselves, of a package broken in transit. In the military, it is no different. That is one of the problems we faced in military packaging and rapid prototyping. We are rapid prototyping and military packaging of military technologies. So within these past two weeks, our group learned firsthand the complex process that goes behind designing military, 
military technologies and packaging them, shipping them to war fighters who need them all over the world. A quick overview of our project. We were tasked with creating a static detector to suit the needs of the warfighter at the Chemical Biological Center, CBC for short. We followed an alternative engineering design process. Design, build, test, and package. We were required to build a static detection device with a volume of no more than 16 cubic inches. We added an on-off switch for ease of use and uh, reinforced the antenna due to breakage in the field. And then we designed a package around it to keep it safe. One very important part of the project was making sure that it was very usable and feasible for the warfighter to use. Uh, one way we did this was by making it uh, a lot lighter and a lot smaller. That way it did not hinder them so that they wouldn't have to carry a large object. The first step of the design process is brainstorming. We use post notes, a whiteboard, and some group discussion to basically get our ideas out in the open, and then we personally selected the ideas that we favored most and integrated them into our designs. So in the top picture, you can see Lara and I um, showing off our sketch and discussing the components of it to the entire group. And in the bottom picture, you can see us all huddled around a whiteboard where we posted post-it notes that had all our ideas on it. We called it the brain dump. In order to convert our sketches into physical devices, we used a CAD software called SOLIDWORKS. Following the completion of these models, we printed the figures in CBC's Makerspace out of ABS plastic. In the top picture is one of the interns helping Carlene design her 3D uh, sketch in SOLIDWORKS. And in the bottom picture is her uh, 2D design, which features her triangular shape. Another very important part of the project was a working circuit board. In order to do this, we would have to hook up the wires using soldering and then make sure that it was able to sense the static and light up the LED. This was able to make our final device functional. In the top, you can see me um, building my circuit board in order to get my device working. In the bottom, you can see Julian having an absolute blast finishing up some solder points. <laughs> And finally, we tested the ruggedness of our devices. Our detectors went through a series of tests. First, we tested to see if vibration would survive, um, the, the device would survive vibration. Then we made sure our antenna are antennas are strong enough by pulling them down. And of course, a static detection evaluation. The image on the left depicts the antenna pull test, which consists of 200 gram weight pulling on the antenna for two minutes. The image on the right depicts a five minute vibration test while it is occurring. We were given the freedom to design our packaging however we wanted to. We had access to many different types of mil-spec foam and fiberboard. We just needed to make sure that the packs would be able to survive intense military testing. Another very important part of the design was the package itself. We ended up making hard exteriors. As seen on the left, we have Mark safely cutting a cardboard tube for the exterior. On the right, we have Carlene, or the left, we have Carlene <laughs> cutting foam. Um, we tested the packaging by dropping it eight times from different orientations at six feet. And then we did a 20 minute vibration test which simulates 100 miles on a rough road in the back of a truck, a full water submersion test, and an electrostatic discharge assurance test. And so this is the vibration test, we call it the loose cargo test. So it was literally meant to make our package tumble around and see if they'd survive that kind of transportation. Uh, it was done twice, 10 minutes each, and as Logan said, 100 miles, uh, which translates to 100 miles off road. All of us did pass the packaging portion, and on the far left you see my design. It was a cylindrical design with a switch on the bottom. Mine was a rectangular prism, and one difficulty I had was making it so that you could see the LED. And mine is in the middle and it's a triangular prism. So it has a telescoping antenna that you can pull out so that the scope of the radius would be bigger. My device is the black cylinder with a screw cap enclosure. Mine was the rectangular prism on the right and one difficulty I had was the lid breaking in 3D printing. And before we would end our presentations, we want to thank um, Arise, Ditra, and everyone who made JSTI possible, CBC, and of course our mentors, they were so supportive uh, the entire time, and our wonderful, perfect, amazing, A plus 100% Melvin, our best <laughs> RT here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and up next we're going to have a video by our amazing videography team. Thank you.
My name is Logan and I'm in military packaging and rapid prototyping. We are designing, building, and testing an electric static sensor for warfighters to decrease fire hazards around explosives and flammable. The first step of the design process is brainstorming and find the best ideas to create the most the static sensor with the greatest capabilities. After that, we, did, we worked with interns here at CBC to put, use a CAD system to put our designs into SOLIDWORKS. We uh, then later created the electronic system that would be the internals of our static detector. The final pro step of this process was we packaged these electric static sensors to ship to our warfighters in perfect condition. We just tried helping each other throughout it, making sure that everybody's design was working, functional, and uh, didn't break at all. One of the coolest things we did was I learned how to solder and design circuit boards, which I had never done before. And it was nice to be able to know that I can fix my own electronics if something were to break. Hello. Okay, at this time I'm going to take a 15 minute break. So if you would, just go ahead and uh, make yourself the restrooms again are out and to your left and there should be some water for your, uh, for your thirst, if you're thirsty.
Sharon, Sharon. A one, a two, Sharon. But the hat does Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will get prepared to start back up again in the next five minutes. So if you will take your seats so that we can get started. Thank you kindly.
grab one. Check my. Check my. All right, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Need everybody's attention? Needs everybody's attention? Thank you very much. All right, we are the videography group, and today we're going to be comparing the human eye and the camera lens. So like a phone camera lens and a human eye. I'm Autumn Cook. I'm Chloe Marini. I'm Andrew Mosey. And I'm Eric Ross. So humans rely mainly on sight. Like, we observe things with our sight, with our eyes. So right now, you guys are observing us up here, presenting to you guys. Observations. Next slide, please. Oh. Now, our eyes aren't perfect. Our eyes may deceive us. or things like illusions. Sometimes you may see things. Things are just, our eyes, sometimes they get, they get tricked out. They make mistakes. They're normal. They're natural. They're eyes. They make mistakes. Okay. Now, there's things called camera adjustments. With our cameras, they make adjustments. You can turn up brightness. This is what a camera is. You can turn up brightness. You can make things better. You can put filters on things. Okay. All right. So now, what we did was we documented the videos you guys saw after people's presentations. We documented those, and those are the stories we've told. We've told stories like stem things. Like, we've showed everybody's story. We've done that. And we're pretty proud of that. Yet cameras create images that can be held, foes that will last lifetimes. While the images we get from our eyes get stored in our brains to be forgotten. Both are very similar though, from a structural standpoint. Our irises control the amount of light hitting the rhea we focus automatically, and also our brains fill in the empty, em empty spots or images we miss. Cameras also have equipment to do this, but the photographer needs to adjust the focus and the brightness manually, and the editors would need to fix anything that the photographer didn't catch, not to mention that the designer of the camera would have to create an accurate design. Because even though you don't know it, cameras' images are the first are, are first upside down and are backwards. So but we set out with three cameras to recreate a setting, a setting that everyone sees every day, but we force them to see it how we want them to. We use a DJI gimbal, a GoPro Hero 6, and a Nikon. First, we have the Nikon. The Nikon has many settings for focusing and for lighting for, uh, for areas around you. With certain aspects, you're able to see what the camera sees without a delay. This is ideal for things like sports and low light shooting. Then we have the GoPro Hero 6. A GoPro is a small camera that is really good at getting low ground view footage. It can also fit in small places that bigger cameras can't fit. Unfortunately, the GoPro has no image stabilization. Finally, we have the DJI gimbal. A DJI gimbal has three motors and is able to move, be moved up, down, left, and right. Its purpose is to produce a steady video. Its drawback, though, is that it cannot zoom in or out. Once we had our materials and our knowledge for both the eyes and the camera, we had to perform our experiment. It stumped us for a couple of days, but then we came to the conclusion of two images. So the images are exactly the same, but we changed the focus on both of them. The first image is the picture of a purple flower in focus. Uh, people who like this one like that it was simplistic, that it was the idea that what was in front is what is more important. And the second one was in focus of the background. People like this one because it showed, it showed more of the picture and that it didn't have the awkward framing of the first one, even though that one was more preferred by those we asked. And suddenly our experiment started to focus more on the subject's viewpoints rather than the technological aspects that we had been focusing on before. And we realized as photographers and as editors that we can change the perspective 
of those around us. We can make them see the big picture or we can make them focus on the little things. Either way, we can make them see the human aspects even in pictures that they don't take themselves. And suddenly we're presented with this thing where science, yes, has all the facts and we need to find specific solutions, but the solution is also found when we have creativity in that. So even though the camera takes the picture, isn't it the human eye that sees the beauty in it? This was videography. We'd like to thank our mentors, Gary and Sharon, for being awesome, and everybody else for letting us follow them around all day and be weirdos. <laughs> Thanks. Now we're going to play bloopers for you guys. Hope you guys enjoy them. They're pretty funny. do in class. Sorry. Are you good? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Josie from 3D Printing with Michael. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to ask me questions now? You keep going into it. And we created circuit boards and used these circuit boards. I don't know. <laughs> My name is Kira, and I was working on a Stratos, 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 Sugar Plums. We're just going to restart. Okay, ready? Hi, Sharon. How are you today? Testing. One, two, three, four. Okay. Now that's a tough video to follow. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Michael Bloomfield. I'm a science teacher from Carlin, Nevada. I teach life science, earth science, and physical science. Over the past two weeks, Is it going? No. over the past two weeks, I've had the privilege of working at the US Army Medical Research Institute of Chemical Defense, working with Dr. Rockwood to help find an intramuscular antidote for cyanide poisoning. Our experimentation was done with CD1 lab mice, uh, cyanide, and dimethyl trisulfide, or DMTS. Um, these labs were conducted twice with two different formulations, and it was really kind of crazy cool. The first step was we had to weigh out the mice. This is because the injection of cyanide and the injection of DMTS were both dependent on the weight of the mouse. After we weighed them out, we then gave them one of two injections. The first one being a subcutaneous injection of cyanide, followed up within a minute of an injection of DMTS. <clears throat> the second one was again subcutaneous injection of cyanide, followed by what they called the vehicle. And the vehicle was primarily water and alcohol. But what it does is it allows the DMTS to move from point A to point B, just like a car would move humans. But in this case, it's DMTS, point A being the syringe, point B being the mouse. Now, with this experiment, there was one of two outcomes. The mouse would live, and we'd be happy. Or the mouse would pass on, and we would keep it for studying later. We would gather all this data, testing quite a few mice, and put it into a computer program that would then tell us the next dosage amount, depending on whether the mouse lived or died, as well as compiling some pretty kind of cool graphs if you're nerdy like me. The graph that's going to be popping up here shortly 
is our safety study graph testing the toxicity of this formulation of DMTS. If you look at the graph, the positive slope, or increasing dosage amounts, means the mice lived. When the slope goes negative, or the doses go down, the mice were dying. Now the big question for us is what are we going to take back to the classroom? And over the past two weeks, we've done a lot. We've seen a lot. So the short answer is I'm taking back a lot. The main thing is my prowess as a master mouse wrangler. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't think that will help me in the classroom all that much. What will be helping me in the classroom is something a little less tangible, like persistence, learning that no matter how much you plan a science procedure experiment out, it can go wrong. And you don't just get to stop and call it quits. You have to go back and rethink it. The fact that Miss Frizzle was always right. In science, you have to take chances. You have to make mistakes. And if you do the first two right, chances are you're going to get messy. Mice are incredibly messy, <laughs> FYI. One of the larger things is not to be afraid to ask questions. In the lab, I worked with three PhDs, two master's degrees for, as lab techs. There's a lot of knowledge there. And the best way for me to get that knowledge was to ask the question, why, how, when, what? If I didn't do that, I wouldn't have learned. My students and the students out there should learn from this too and always ask those questions. The last thing I learned, and I'm taking back to the classroom, is humility. Like I've mentioned, there was a lot of knowledge in the room I was working in. I had the least amount of education and a lot of unknown. So it put me in the position of my students. I didn't know, they did, and I had to take a second and go, whoa, I'm not a teacher, I am a student. I have to step back, listen, instead of trying to talk so much. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Rockwood and his lab. Thank you to everyone involved, JSTI, ORIs, everyone. It's been an amazing experience. And I would like to say I'm Michael Bloomfield, and thank you for attending my TED Talk. <laughs>
Our group created a goal which was hitting a target with as much accuracy and precision as possible. The idea of imperfect detection is one can count part of a population, but not the whole. In this example, only some of the elephants are visible. The whole population cannot be observed, which makes us underestimate it. We then inserted the two equations mentioned earlier in the program called R. R is a language of code used by mathematicians worldwide. One way R is used is for calculating populations as well as it is used in a more simplistic way such as a calculator. One of the simulations our group learned about over these two weeks is the Markov process, a model that transitions through a series of states in which the probability of transitioning to future states is uniquely determined by the current state, like this example of weather. A good way to look at another Markov process, an epidemic, is through the susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered states of being, the compartmental model SEER. SEER builds a reliable simulation that epidemiologists can use to predict the spread of a disease. Our visual representation of the SEER model took place in Poland. After choosing influenza, smallpox, and yes, even a zombie virus, <laughs> We watched as the Markov process played out on a massive scale. We could even modify the settings to create custom epidemics that could wreak havoc or not, depending on the power of probability. Disease spread is an example of a CBRN hazard. All disaster deployments involve CBR CBRN hazards, which are chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear hazards. These hazards are extremely dangerous to the human population, which is why it is extremely important that we are aware of these hazards and know how we are affected by them. There are four main types of hazards. Chemical hazards include toxic chemicals, flammable chemicals, acids and bases. Biological, biological hazards include bacteria, uh, viruses and parasites. Radiation and nuclear hazards involve nuclear power plants, nuclear uh, weapons and radiation devices. So these hazards are why programs like the Hazard Prevention and Assessment Capabilities Program, HPAC, exist. HPAC um, works with different tools like weather, terrain, and um, just different tools to create a simulation of what would happen if a CBRN attack were to occur. We are then able to prepare for these attacks and uh, develop plans to get ahead of the problem before it occurs. This powerful tool, along with the other important uh, concepts we learned during the, our time at JSTI, are, why, are improving our futures as students and the country as a whole. Thank you so much to Dr. Ronald Han, or Han, Darnell Gardner, Mike Krasuski, Dr. Tom Ingersoll, Dominic Pam, Janie Kimball, Nirmala Pinto, Sandra Mendez, and Ben Burley. We appreciate the opportunity provided to us by Hartford Community College, the Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, and the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's science, Joint Science and Technology Office for Chemical and Biological Defense. Because of you, we cannot wait to enter the STEM workforce. Thank you. Now please enjoy a short montage of our group from the videography group over the past two weeks. My name is Kier and I was working on a Stratopult project. So the goal of the whole project was to um, launch an object and hit a target. And so within that project, you had the stratopult, and then uh, the group, we attached a rubber band, which created tension, obviously. And then we discovered an angle that would be able to um, launch, that we would have to launch an object from in order to hit a certain target. And then we were able to adjust where the rubber band was on like the different poles in order to create the perfect tension. So you don't want it too loose, you don't also want it too tight, you just need it like right in the middle. And what we discovered is that having the um, rubber band in a straight line in proportion to the two poles what, um, got the best tension because it was like on a diagonal, it just didn't work very well. When we originally started it, we hit it in our second in our second trial, which was actually you know pretty cool.
Hi, I'm Barbie Vina from Pennsylvania. I'm going to challenge you to think about your favorite teacher. I know that everyone here has a favorite teacher. What was it about that teacher that made her your favorite? Was it because you wore the same shirts or you have the same mad dancing skills? Or was it a deeper connection? No matter the reason, they have stuck with you and become a special part of you. Whoever it was that sparked your interest and led you to getting your hands dirty will remember that person. You probably have a mental image of that person right now. You were influenced to be the person you are right now by this person. You may be wondering where I'm going with this, but what we all have in common is that at some point in our lives, you will be a student or a teacher. Not always in the high school or academic sense, but you'll always be learning or teaching something. During my time in the lab, I witnessed so much science that my head actually hurts. Uh, but I was more impressed with the people of the labs, the way that they connected with one another. I felt a togetherness among the principal investigator and their lab techs. By listening to their conversations, you could tell there was a sense of caring. Uh, not only they knew each other's research, they also knew each other personally. There was a natural banter in the labs and hallways. Reser researchers would openly share their accomplishments and stumbling points. I strive to create a similar open learning environment in my classroom. I want to take a minute and tell you about a unique friendship between Maurice Stokes and Jack Twyman, two amazing basketball players. They played together in the NBA until 1958, when Stokes tragically fell and hit his head. The next day, Stokes suffered several seizures, and he never recovered and was fully paralyzed. He was able to care for himself. He was alone. He was far from home, and his medical bills were piling up. Jack Twyman realized this and, as his teammate, had to take care of him. So he stepped up to do it. Twyman said, someone had to do it, so I became that someone. What a neat thing to say. I became that someone. How many people can say that? How many people do you know have stepped up and gave to others without wanting anything in return? This is a type of learning that I want to teach in my classroom. This is a type of learning that I've seen in the labs. This is the type of teaching that I want to teach my students. Recently, I was able to step into the role of a student. I was taught by many different people and enjoyed everyone's patience. During that time, I gathered several teaching hacks that I'm committed to taking back to my classroom. A teacher described his experiences with JSTI as stepping into the role of a student. He spoke about frustrations uh, or failures of his project and then related that to an understanding of his students' struggles. He went on to say that when he returns to his classroom, he will make an effort to slow down his pace so students can get a better understanding of the content. Hack number two, creativity. Lab techs are excited to share their findings and their investigations. I can create this type of information quest in my classroom by allowing students to be creative. Who knows, maybe chicken yoga is more beneficial than traditional yoga. I've realized that variety is needed not only in life, but also in the classroom. Students enjoy shifting gears and relating new experiences to their prior learning. This combination creates student conversations which lead to learning. In science, a failure can teach you as much as a success. Often, students are afraid to try something because they, they're afraid to fail. Having an open learning environment, you, you must encourage failure so that students are not afraid to try. In the labs, I've witnessed many different types of relationships, and I realized the relationship was the key to creating the open learning environment. Uh, a quote from my student says, to be successful, be like Vina. As I close, I challenge everyone, mentors, students, teachers, to become that someone. Become that someone that reaches out. Become that someone that takes the time to invest in other people's lives. Become that someone that you are meant to be. I'd like to thank Dr. McDonough and all his lab techs who willingly and lovingly refer to themselves as the Big Muppets. Thank you for becoming that someone.
Hello, my name is Sergio Estrada. I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I teach physics at Riverside High School. I would like to start off by thanking the people that allowed me to spend two weeks at the other side of the country, my wife Jasmine, my daughter Eleanor, my son Lucas, and my daughter Jocelyn. My time spent here was at the Advanced Design and Manufacturing Division. They call it the Chocolate Factory. The reason because they do R&D there. They work on drones, they work on virtual reality, they work on 3D printing, they can make and cut anything you want in the fabrication. So my mentors were Mary Kay Peck, packaging specialist, Dave Vincitori, packaging engineer, and electrical engineer, Bob Pazda. Our project built on last year's project. They had to design and build a static detector. So static's very dangerous for the warfighter because it could cause a spark when you definitely don't want a spark, or it can be bad for your electronics. So these were last year's designs. If you look in the top left, you'll notice that they just have the wires kind of freely in there, which caused some problems that we were going to address. So we looked at the requirements given to us in the product improvement plan. We organized our thoughts, created a brain map. Then we did many, many concept sketches and tried to get the best design. So before coming here, I was really afraid of 3D printing, and I was afraid of SolidWorks. But after spending a day with the interns, and 3D printing my own things, I'm excited to bring that back to my community. So you see me right there, printing the thing that got printed, not just some random picture on the computer. So uh, one of the things that we did is that we created a circuit board and we added it to our design. So this circuit board was to, when we tested, things wouldn't jostle around and those connections would stay in place. So I hadn't soldered since probably some college and it was a lot of fun. Then we took a break. We went to the company picnic where I got to eat a lot of steamed crab, broke it with a hammer, never done that before. And we got to compete uh, making instruments. We beat the interns, we beat some engineers, and we lost to some pros. So packaging is a really big deal I, didn't, I never thought about. So many types of styrofoams that colors have meanings. There's a bunch of cardboard that I had no idea existed. And I went ahead and did some heat sealing. Then we tested. So our testing had to be submerged for about a minute under water. Then we had to drop from different orientations from a six foot fall. Then we put it on this huge shake table and then we had left it there for 20 minutes to simulate 200 miles. So you can see our results, pass, 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 several fails in there. Uh, so we built, we really improved upon last year's results where they had about a 38 passing rate versus 88% passing rate, probably that circuit board. So I'm from El Paso, Texas. That's my school right there. And that black arrow is the Mexican border. A lot of my students cross over every day, 99% Latino and 100% of them get free lunch. So teaching's about begging, borrowing, and stealing. So let me show you what I'm gonna beg and borrow from JSTI. So my students right here have come before Michael Nava, Jimena, and Stephanie Cisneros are now pursuing degrees in engineering, environmental science, and math and all because of JSTI, the impact that this program has is huge. So this is a circuit board that I'm gonna steal from my classroom for my circuits lesson in conductivity, and I, my kids are gonna solder in class, something they've never done before, and they're gonna start incorporating it, incorporating it. I also do a lot of community engagement. Every spring, me and my students go to local elementaries, and we do interactions with over a thousand students at different elementary schools. I'm gonna borrow some of the things that I saw here with them and gonna bring it to my school. I also do a camp for incoming ninth graders in engineering. I'm gonna steal the two week project that we did here and I'm gonna modify it for one week and we're gonna go ahead and use the three printers at our school that I had no idea how to use. I also made a lot of connections and I'm gonna beg the people that I met in this room to go ahead and Skype with my students. I do a thing called Skype with the engineer once a month and a lot of these people have already agreed to go ahead and be part of that and be excited for that. And the thing I'm, that I'm gonna take back also is these many jobs that I didn't know existed, this many career paths to get there that I also didn't know were so unique. I didn't know there was such thing as packaging engineering that was an actual major. I know that now and I know a lot of my students are gonna know a lot more. I like to end it by thanking all the wonderful people at JSTI. I put them through a lot with all my horrible jokes but they were kind enough to laugh along with me and I really appreciate all of them and the hard work that they put in during these two weeks. And last of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Casey, Jen Tyrell, and Marie Westfall for allowing me to spend two weeks here. It was an amazing experience. Darnell and Luis, couldn't find a picture of you guys, but 
much love to you guys. Thanks for having me. And everyone at DITRA, thank you very much. The modern day warfighter is threatened by many bio warfare agents used as weapons by the enemy. Even though the protection and de detection of bio warfare agents have been strengthened, the enemy has discovered more severe bio warfare agents. New antibiotics will help diminish the severity of these bio warfare agents. Today, the government and private sectors hold a library of DNA to help discover and create new antibiotics. Antibiotics were created by accident in the 20th century. However, ancient civilizations, such as the Egyptians, used other means to stop infections. They used moldy bread and applied it to the infected wounds. Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin upon returning from Suffolk in 1928. The bacteria Staphylococcus was left uncovered in a plate, and Fleming saw the fungus Penicillium notatum contaminated it. The fungus was isolated, and Fleming grew the mold in pure culture. And it was found to be very effective for the treatment of infections. After early human trials, British pharmaceutical companies ensured mass productions of penicillin was possible. Treatment with penicillin was hugely successful, and the US government began supporting production. The antibiotic was widely used to treat warfighters for the infections in the field and hospitals by D-Day in 1944. Now on to microbes and microbiomes. We collected water samples from three microbiomes, Frogmortar Creek, Flint River, and the Chesapeake Bay. There are two major classes of microbes, bacteria and fungi. Um, our research group used a 0.22 micron filter to collect the microbes needed uh, for our research. Um, the filter not only caught the microbes needed, but it also sterilized the water completely, which also made it drinkable as well. Synthetic biology is a science in which you take DNA from a naturally occurring organism and alter it to create an organism not naturally occurring. Synthetic biology combines biology, math, engineering, and other disciplines. In our project, we removed microbes from our water samples and isolated their DNA. We injected this DNA into an engineered bacterial host cell. This host will hopefully produce biosynthetic gene clusters, which, which will produce antibiotic forming pathways. We've, we place these bacterial gene clusters on a dish and let them grow overnight. These cells will, should produce clear spots called zones of inhibition, and these clear spots should indicate clones showing antibiotic activity. Um, our project began with collecting water from three different sources, the Flint River, Chesapeake Bay, and Frog Mortar Creek. We then filtered this water using cheesecloth uh, and three other filters to remove the dirt and fine particles from the water. After this, we used a 0.2 micron filter to collect the microbes from the water, which also completely sterilized it. After this, we, we um, isolated the microbes and processed them. In order to do this, we removed the microbial cells from the 0.2 filter using filter wash buffer we created. We then mixed this and spun it down to separate the filter wash buffer from the cells. We then pulled off the liquid and kept the cells in the form of a cell pellet. After this, we isolated the DNA from the cell pellet and precipitated it with isopropanol followed by ethanol. This removed any excess salts and impurities from the... Um, our next step, uh, use gel electrophoresis. We ran the DNA on a standard agarose gel to see the size of our DNA on a gel electrophoresis. The result of our gel showed that we had 48.5 kilobase pairs, which is a very good number. The DNA will be inserted into an engineered E. coli host in Alabama. The misuse and overuse of antibiotics lead to drug-resistant bacteria. This can cause diseases that used to be easily treatable, such as the flu, deadly. Deaths by drug-resistant bacteria, or superbugs, are expected to surpass the death toll of cancer by 2050. 
Our solution is to look in extreme environments for new microorganisms. This will help because these environments have not yet been explored much and hold different microorganisms that can create different antibiotics than the ones we have now. So in conclusion, we collected water, we filtered the water, and we isolated its DNA, which created a metagenomic environmental DNA library. And as you can see, there's a picture of the bacteria and a picture of the DNA. So now, the library will be sent off to researchers in Alabama to be engineered into a bacterial host to be further tested for antibiotic activity. So um, we look forward for our potential antibiotic being used to protect our warfighter. Um, and we also like to give a special thanks to Dr. Ronald Hand from DITRA, Darnell Gardner from DITRA, uh, Dr. V William Vosberg from, uh, from ORISE, um, and the entire Oak Ridge team of Marie Westfall, Jennifer Tyrell, Jennifer Casey, and Karen Brummett. We would also like to give a special thanks to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation staff, the Sod Run Wastewaters treatment staff, the team at Harford Community College, and the best photographer, Luis Palacio. We would also like to give thanks to our mentor, Kyle Lewis, our mentor, Kyle Lewis, our alumni, Emma Garcia, our resident teacher, Terry Reeves, and all of the other resident teachers, and our participants who made this best who made this the best two weeks possible. Thank you. Um, two week recap video made by our lovely videography group. Well, we are trying to find a new antibiotic. Uh, the reason that we're doing this, uh, the reason there's such a pressing need for this is because the antibiotic resistance death toll is said to surpass the death toll uh, caused by cancer. First start off with DNA from an extremophilic source, extremophilic meaning um, greater than average temperature uh, these extreme environments. We have samples from El Salvador, Kamchatka. We're taking this water that we collect and we're first removing all the large matter from it via uh, cheesecloth or whatnot. We're getting rid of the rock, we're getting rid of the slime. One of the reasons that I feel so good about it is these students are so amazing. They're very brilliant, um, above average. And this project that they're working on is beyond any kind of uh, project that they will work on in college, that they would work on in graduate school. It exceeds a project that would be done at the PhD level. Uh, this is something that you would do at the postdoc level, and these students are doing that. A rubber-based adhesive applied to a durable duck cloth backing created out of necessity during World War II for quick repairs to equipment, vehicles, and weapons. It's also waterproof. How many rolls do you have? U2, also known as the Dragon Lady, made its first flight August 1st, 1955. Flown during the Cold War of the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cuba, and other various missions leading the way to UAVs, such as drones. World War II radar operators discovered weather could hinder the readouts, causing echoes. As technology developed, scientists detected and deciphered the weather patterns, allowing for prediction of weather, including rain, snow, sleet, and hail, and more. Second highest priority project during World War II in the radar technology while building a magnetron for radar sets, keen observations prompted further testing. Eventual addition of popcorn kernels in the magnetron yielded the first microwave popcorn. A leaked image taken by the KH-11, a digital camera mounted spy satellite, yielded such high resolution, it eventually led to the first self-contained versions of commercial digital cameras in your phone, and your DSLRs. 
Punch cards and mechanical looms led the way to an electronic digital program computer called Colossus. ENIAC was the first electronic general purpose computer able to solve large classes of numerical problems through reprogramming. One of the last hush-hush boys, Joseph Sorda, died at the age of 96 in 2017. He worked on jet engines. His contribution helped us to win World War II, and he shrank the world for the rest of us. The Axis occupied regions of natural rubber, now unavailable to allied forces. They had to adapt. A new, cheaper version of synthetic rubber helped to meet the United States' needs during World War II. It also gave us silly putty. Initial development for infantry use, followed by field artillery and tank crews to provide convenient communications in the battlefield. The remote two-way radio communications helped to give the way to further future cell networks and modern cell phones. Franklin originally invented pads to help stop bleeding to of wounded soldiers while receiving medical treatment. In 1920, to make use of leftover bandages from World War I, Kimberly Clark created the feminine hygiene product known as Kotex. Auto injectors were originally developed for the rapid administration of nerve gas, antidotes, and kits intended for soldiers. Today, it's used for allergic responses, especially from stings. Got one? Better keep it handy. Developed in the 30s for use by military pilots to protect their eyes while flying, replacing the classic flight goggles, being lighter, thinner, thinner and snazzier, eventually trademarked by Ray-Bans, Aviators have since risen to the iconic status in the civilian world. Just ask Tom. Soldiers stationed in the South Pacific needed a way to kill mosquitoes. Got to keep away from malaria. If Napoleon had this technology, Jefferson couldn't have bought the Louisiana Purchase. In 1977, in the form of his forefather, the ARPANET, this network technology, along with TCP IP, became the technical foundation of the internet as we know it today. By the mid-1990s, WWW invaded the classroom. Navstar is a network of US satellites that provide GPS services used for navigation by, by both military and civilian, Check out your Google account. If your locations are turned on, you'll get a monthly report of where you've been. World-class scientists and engineers have been creating cutting-edge technologies for warfighters for more than a century. In military laboratories, as you can see, it becomes part of our everyday lives. Items we take for granted as conveniences were once created to ensure the protection of our freedoms. All brought to you by research and development using STEM. Scientists doc like Dr. Angela Ziegler use STEM skills every day to research and develop and solve actual and perceived problems to better protect our warfighters and advance our capabilities in the future. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Caballo as my mentor. Your knowledge and time spent with me has been priceless. I learned much from you in this short amount of time. Best of luck in your work. And uh, Dr. Moore, it was great to spend some time with you on Thursday. Thanks for the visit. I'm Cindy Berkner. Thank you, JSTI, for giving me this opportunity to participate in cutting edge research with top notch scientists in their field to better understand how to prepare my students for a future unimagined. My time in a research lab will forever change my approach. Students, your innovation and your approach to challenges is the ultimate determination of your success. Failure is an option. Embrace it and enjoy the process. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Juanita Colbert Kelly. I am a science teacher at Meade Senior High School in Fort Meade, Maryland. The main courses that I teach are honors in standard chemistry and IV chemistry, but I also have taught environmental science, forensic science, and oceanography. During this program, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with Dr. Glaros and Dr. Mock to determine the limit of detection of caffeine from uniform materials by using the open port sampling interface mass spectrometer. 
Before I begin talking about my project, I feel as though I need to explain what a mass spectrometer is. It is an instrument that collects a sample and produces ions which are detected and analyzed. Then a mass spectrum is produced which shows the number of ions that were detected by the instrument. There are different types of mass spectrometers. There is gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, paper spray ionization, and the list goes on. The mass spectrometer that I worked on was the OPSI, the Open Port Sampling Interface. The interface produces a small bubble of extraction solvent where the sample is inserted. The solvent sample mixture travels through the tube into the electrospray ionization source and ions are formed. The ions travel until they hit the detector and a mass spectrum is produced. When I began working on this project, different concentrations of caffeine solutions needed to be prepared using methanol as the solvent. I worked with caffeine because it was a safe alternative to use. Precisely two microliters of 100 micrograms per milliliter caffeine solutions were placed on different uniform materials. The samples were placed in the extraction bubble on this interface for 20 seconds and a mass spectrum was produced. The multilayer defense garment was chosen to determine the limit of detection and the limit of quantitation. Two microliters of dilute caffeine solutions were placed on pieces of the garment and the sample was placed in the extraction bubble. There were some challenges that appeared before the data was collected. We need to make sure the settings were established in the software. We need to figure out which caffeine solutions the OPSI could detect. We need to figure out uh, which uniform materials to use. This is a full scan of the ions detected from the sample on the inner and outer layer of the multi-layer defense garment. The full scan on the top shows the caffeine peak clearly with a mass charge ratio of 195 and a small amount of other ions being detected. This is a SIM scan which focuses on the number of caffeine ions that were detected for the inner and outer layer of the multi-layer defense garment. The top scan shows that there was a lot of caffeine detected from the outer layer due to the peak increasing. The bottom scan shows that no caffeine was detected. Based on all of the tests that were performed and the data that was collected, the limit of detection of caffeine was estimated to be 15.3 nanograms. The limit of the quantitation was 51.2 nanograms. The OPSI is a powerful instrument that can easily pick up caffeine samples from the outer layer of the multi-defense garment. If I can continue working with the OPSI, I would want to conduct more trials on the inner layer of the multi-layer defense garment. It could not detect the caffeine at lower concentrations. I would increase the concentration of caffeine until I could determine the limit of detection for this material. I have taught many different science courses at Mead Senior High School. I plan on taking the experience and knowledge and knowledge that I have gained from this program and apply it to my IB chemistry class. I hope this will encourage my students to consider a career in STEM or at least show a greater interest in science. IV Chemistry is a rigorous course that is offered at my school through the International Baccalaureate Dipo Diploma Program. Students use the chemistry knowledge gained in the classroom and apply it to multiple laboratory experiments. Standard and honors chemistry students do not have the opportunity to complete as many labs as IV Chem students. During this course, the students will learn about mass spectrometry. I plan to take the hands-on experience from the lab to describe the process of mass spectrometry in detail. I plan to include a lesson which features OPSI as a technique to analyze a sample. The IB chemistry students are required to complete an internal assessment, also known as an IA. This is an experiment that they design and complete for the class. This is a challenging task for students in the class. Sometimes the experiments do not work out for the students the way they want it to. Some students will change to a different experiment instead of figuring out what they could do differently with their uh, current experiment. I plan to use my experience of trial and error from my project to encourage future IB chemistry students to not give up on their experiment. Being a participant in this program has allowed me to meet many people from many different areas of science. I hope to invite some of the people that I have met to my classroom so they can help encourage my students to think about science differently or even consider a career in STEM. I have also met many wonderful teachers who I am honored to call my friends. I hope to continue to exchange information about classroom resources and science programs. I also hope to continue to exchange funny stories and wonderful experiences. I want to thank Dr. Gleros and Dr. Mock for your guidance through this entire project. I want to thank JSTI for this wonderful opportunity to work in the lab and the enjoyable, enjoyable excuse me, field trips. Thank you to all who support this program. This has been an amazing experience. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. 
My name is Eudine Mods Williams. I am from the beautiful island state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I teach environmental science and biology in the District of Columbia. My loves, in the middle is my husband, on the far left is my mother in St. Vincent, and on the right is me playing the jumbo drums in South Africa, which means everyone gathered together in peace. Questions answer. Sometimes in life, a situation presents more questions than answer. This was the case with the experiment I was conducting. Everything went wrong, nothing worked. I had to remain focused and remember, there are always challenges in life, but you never give up. No matter the situation, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. How many of you have seen this image before? What about this image? Did you know that exposure to high concentration of cyanide at high dosages can be fatal to both humans and animals? Cyanide poisoning can manifest in various ways, such as headaches, anxiety, respiratory depression, and even in some cases, coma. Dimethyl trisulfide, DMS, DMTS, is being studied as a countermeasure for cyanide poisoning. The use of DMTS for cyanide poisoning has shown better results than current treatment. The ongoing studies on the effectiveness of DMTS have increased the demand for analy analytical methods to detect and quantitate DMTS in biological samples. For cyanide studies, LCMS, is a desired technique for such analysis due to rapid analysis time, high sensitivity, and the efficiency offered for working with limited biological samples. A rapid and sensitive technique was developed to quantitate DMTS and whole, black, whole blood from rats. Calibration curves were generated from stock solutions prepared by serial dilutions and spike individually due to the instability of DMTS in whole blood. These were the results in solid phase extraction, blood, and PBS containing DMTS was successful as a countermeasure. Through all this, the one thing that I have gained and learned, no matter your current situation or what happens in your life, focus on the goals and not the obstacles. I remained focused, regained my confidence, and was able to conduct and complete the experiment. I teach and have taught in some of the poorest neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. I have students that are homeless, parents incarcerated, their only meal is in the school building, and often I am the one supplying that meal. This experiment has been humbling. I believe that nothing is by accident and everything in life presents a learning lesson. More than anything, it has reinforced for me the will to persevere, no matter what the situation, circumstances. If anything, I will take from this experience and reinforce to my students, no matter the environmental factors or what obstacles may come your way, focus on the goal and not the obstacles. A thank you, a special, special thank you to the amazing people I have been blessed to meet this experience would not have been pop, would have been as wonderful without their friendship and support. A most heartfelt thanks to my mentor, Dr. Ross Pennington. None of this would have been possible if it was not for his dedication, time, willingness to accept my mistake and pushing me out of my comfort zone. 
I will forever be grateful for him and all the sponsors for this program for affording me this amazing opportunity. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Testing. Last one. You guys ready? It's lunchtime, right? All right. Half a day. My name is Paul Quaresma. I traveled overseas from Guam, Dodea Guam High School, to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and I had the pleasure to work with, together with the Rapid Prototyping and Military Package Design Team. Whenever I come to conferences, I always approach activities from a global systems perspective. Therefore, I'd like to start off by acknowledging DITRA, who kindly funds this event, and ORISE, who worked tirelessly all year and then barely sleep when on the ground managing logistics for this program. And through their collaboration, they bring us here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the US Army, the US Army Futures Command, and finally, the Combat Capabilities Development Command of Chemical Biological Center. Without their help, this program would not be possible, which then leads to where my mentors spend their day jobs. Mary Kay Peck and Dave Vincitori with the CBC Department of Packaging, Handling, Storage, and Transportation, and Bob Pazda with the CBC De Department of Advanced Design and Manufacturing. When I first arrived, I had a lot of high expectations. As you can see from this graph depicting expected percentage of smiling as a function of time, I was expected to have a consistently perfect time every single day. You can see that the initial condition starts high and remain high all year. <laughs> However, that wasn't the case. Based on this actual reality graph, there were days that were not optimally happy. The first sad day was when we found out exactly how hard we were going to work and, and all the deliverables that we had to submit. The second sad day was on Friday, when our group had a technical error on the 3D printer and it set us back for a few days. The second week was good, until Thursday, when we were all stressing about our presentations. <laughs> and now we're back to Friday. <laughs> Approaching this project from a big picture doesn't get any bigger than this chart, which depicts the Department of Defense acquisition life cycle compliance baseline. You want to build a new mil-spec fighter jet? This is your life. This is your jam. This process takes forever, and it to produce a single deployable asset for our warfighters. The mentors we work for are a tiny part of this process. What I've learned, however, is that a major part of the job is to rap rapidly de develop defense threat countermeasures. Imagine that your development team gets a call from the Pentagon with an UANS, an urgent operational needs statement. A DEF CON 3 level chemical biological threat has been identified and your team has been directed to develop a countermeasure immediately deployable to the warfighters. Your team does not have the time to go through this convoluted process. We need to prototype the countermeasure and get it to the warfighter immediately. That's where rapid prototyping and military package design team fits in a war against our adversaries. I can bog you down with all the technical details of our lab experience. However, I can assure you we've had enough. And I'm hungry, and you're all staring at me to finish. We toured the facilities, we worked in their labs, we even met several deputy directors, directors, and even Dr. Moore himself. We did cool stuff outside the lab. We got a taste of local Maryland. We attended the, their company picnic and won second place in the Battle of the Bands where we created instruments and played the US Army song. Now, a big question kept coming up here in the last two weeks. They say that when you come to JSTI, you'll take, one, take away one of two things. You will either A, Learn that you definitely want to pursue a job doing science, math, or engineering. Or B, you clearly don't want to pursue a job in math, science, or engineering. And that's perfectly OK. At least you figured it out early. What I've learned for myself is that I may no longer be able to be a scientist or engineer that I always wanted to do when I was younger. I struggled a little bit trying to understand everything going on. The language that the scientists and engineers use was always above my head. My career path has been paved, and I will likely not be able to become an engineer or a scientist anymore. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed. 
Professionally, I'm at a point in my career that makes sense for my family and me. Plus, my daughters love that I get to take summers off with them. And you know what? I'm not even sad. In fact, I'm absolutely excited. You see, we've met a lot of professionals with awesome jobs and responsibilities, multiple masters and PhDs. Could you imagine giving a five-minute Ignite presentation to the Pentagon and the joint, uh, with the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Yeah, neither can I. Because let me allow, allow me to explain why my job is so awesome. We get to motivate the next generation scientist, engineer, artist, communicator, explorer. I got a C minus in stats, but I can guarantee you with 100% confidence that each and every one of you had a, an educator that influenced you one time or another in your life. My job may not sound as sexy, but let me tell you, we are the agents of change. We are molding the next generation of scientists, and my name is Paul Charisma, together with all the other educators in this room, especially my teacher squad, we produce the next generation of superheroes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Emma. I'm currently going to Drake University. I will be starting my second year of pre-pharmacy. So after four more years, I hope to come out with my PharmD and be a transplant pharmacist somewhere in a hospital. Um, I attended JSTI in the year of 2016. And let me tell you, three years ago, I never could have dreamt that I would be selected to be a part of an institute as great as JSTI. But miraculously, I was somehow selected. So you could only imagine my surprise when I was once again selected to be a part of the JSTI team. Being able to experience JSTI as an alum was just as fantastic, if not better, than participating as a student. Having the opportunity to help the students learn something new, or maybe even see them discover their passion, is more than I could have asked for. Throughout the duration of my stay, I was lucky enough to be paired with the Antibiotic Discovery Group. It's, which made me very excited because of its relevance to my field of study. It was such a great experience being able to see my group get excited, learning about how new antibiotics are made, and realizing the importance of their work, not just to civilians, but to the warfighters as well. The advancements being made in medicine are leading to longer, healthier lives, and the increased efficiency of rapid prototyping is helping expand the bounds of technology to those that we have never before seen. The work that GSTI does helps in advancing the progress of STEM, and being able to mentor the intellectuals of the future has been a great honor. I will now turn it over to my friend, Dalton. Hello, everyone. My name is Dalton Tracy. Uh, I'm currently a student attending the University of Nevada at Reno. I'm a computer science major with an emphasis in cybersecurity, and I attended JSTI in 2017. The Joint Science and Technology Institute has been a wonderful opportunity, not only for the students, but for us as well, the alumni. As these long two weeks have passed, we have developed deep friendships and professional connections that we have never before seen. These connections have branched our networks beyond the schools that we attend and the homes or towns, cities that we hail from. Never would I believe that so many people would be willing to help in school, my career, and my journey to get to that place. And I can only thank JSTI for that. As an alumni, I was able to witness, first and foremost, the developing minds of these students change from those of just normal students to those of passionate researchers, people that wanted to find a place in this world. They found a new love for STEM, and that's what this program is about, this institute. Um, from the outside looking in, I can see that this was the change that as a student, I went for, underwent, and truly I'm appreciative of that. Um, as we pursue STEM fields, uh, as students, alumni, teachers, you know, we see that the importance of what we do here and beyond where we take our 
take our lessons that we learned. Our growth in students as alumni in this program can only benefit the future of STEM. All students, past, present, and future, will benefit like I have two years ago and today. So as a thank you, I would like to thank those that have supported us, this program, and the future of STEM. From all of us students, alumni, and teachers, thank you for giving us your time and resources to make an experience like this possible. Without you guys, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have traveled across the country to speak in front of you. And certainly, I wouldn't be pursuing the field that I am today. So thank you. Wow, I'm not gonna get emotional. I said I wouldn't get emotional, I'm, I'm all right. But um, that, for the most part, concludes our cer the ceremonial part of, the, of, the, um, of this event. Uh, we will be serving lunch soon. But I'd like to, again, echo our thanks to all those that supported us, uh, Hartford Community College, University of Delaware, the O-Rise, o, -Rise, o -Rile program, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, parents, friends, students, you all. You, you all are great. And I will keep this in my heart for many years to come, and then it'll be something else. <laughs> no, but if you will, um, again, thank you. Thank you very much. Lunch, I believe, is now being served. So if we don't get a chance to speak later, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for attending, and God bless you all. Thank you.